Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another spoiler review with me, a border prince. And uh, today, it's just going to be a quick one. This is not going to be like super in depth review, uh, mostly because I haven't got the time. So I'm just going to talk briefly about a book that I've really enjoyed recently, which is Farsight Crisis of Faith by Phil Kelly. Now, I sort of came to Phil Kelly's work slightly late. It was by chance, to be completely honest. I picked up, when uh, the whole Primaris thing was first occurring, I was quite eager to demolish as much information on it as possible, uh, you know, about what the hell was going on. And obviously we know how that turned out. <laughs> Although, that being said, they seem to have addressed most of the issues now, especially like Guy Haley. I mean, I'm not going to go into the whole Primaris thing, but Guy Haley seems to have mostly sorted it out and we're basically looking at what it should have been. They're just upscaled space marines. There's no, you know, and the whole Belisarius call thing. I think it's been dealt with as well as it could be, considering the chaotic way it was implemented. Uh, the the authors, the authors have done a good job of sort of making it right, I guess. And Phil Kelly's kind of responsible for that, especially from the Dark Angel point of view. But I don't know where how accurate that is now either, because things are slightly... Ch anyway, it doesn't matter. <laughs> anyway, we're talking about the far side. So there's the far side novel, and this is the first one. Now, this has been out for a long time. Um, in fact, he's written a few different things, and I'll just go into briefly some of them. Like I say, the reason I discovered his work was because I was reading War of Secrets, uh, which was this, you know, it, it it's kind of a lie, that novel. Uh, the, the cover art is kind of a lie because it's not really about Dark Angels at all. <laughs> like, you could strip all the Dark Angel stuff out, and... The core of the book is about the birth of the Tau God and the expedition that goes through the Star Tide Nexus and uh, gets trapped in the warp and they, they become assailed by demons and then rescued essentially by this, this God of the Greater Good, which is one of the most brilliant bits of 40k lore I've seen in a long time. Now, before we go on, obviously I know the Tau get a lot of hate. Uh, people calling them space commies and stuff. And don't get me wrong, I enjoy laughing a joke as well. But, like, I've noticed, like, it's, like, people being... I, I always thought it was just a joke. <laughs> and then I realised that there's some people who actually believe that. And I'm like, wow, you haven't read any of the books, have you? You don't understand this at all. But equally, it's the opposite side of people who are, like, dead into the Tau, like, because the space commie thing, and they're like, oh, against the evil Imperium. Oh, space marines. Um, I don't like either side. I find them really sort of um, immature. Uh, I don't know, yeah. my toy soldier game there's people involved in my toy soldier game who are dead immature <laughs> but you know what I mean like it's, it's like I can if someone talking like that I can tell that these people have just like that all they know is memes if you get me they haven't read any of the novels and they haven't read any of the law and the novels especially because these far sight novels especially the work that Phil Kelly's been doing are so rich and so entertaining and he's doing something with 40k law that I don't think anyone else is really doing, or at least not doing to the same extent. And he really owns the Tau, and I think he does genuinely sort of own the Tau sphere of things. Uh, sphere, yeah, he sort of did the side of things. Uh, they, they, because I think he was one of the sort of original designers, main main developers of the Tau as a as a as a race within 40k. Now I'm an old I'm old school, you see. I mean, I played 40k before the Tau even existed. I remember when they came out. All right, same with Dark Eldar. They, they didn't exist before. I mean, um, yeah, the first white dwarf I bought was when the first Metal Scouts came out, and they were and they were sick. I don't know why they replaced that range because the range they replaced them with were terrible. But anyway, that's a whole other side. <laughs> Gorkamorka, all that Praetorian Guard. That's my era. That's when I started. So the tale for me is still quite new in my mind, even though you know you're going on like twenty years now, and um, the things I like about them are still these core things of a sort of um, an enlightened empire, which is at the same time caste-based. And I don't think people appreciate what this means because we don't really have, especially like in what you want to call the West in our society in general, you know, uh, you don't really have, I mean, India is probably the only place where you have like an actual caste system in place, uh, like a rigid caste system. And um, although it is prominent, it prominent in other parts of the world as well uh, that I've been to and stuff, and I like, I don't know, you know, um, it's difficult for people to appreciate what this means because, like, Europe hasn't had a, 
as it hasn't had a caste system for. I mean, what was the last sort of thing like? There, there was isn't there some caste system in France? There was, um, there was some kind of untouchables in France and things like this. Um, I mean, basically, the Black Death sort of destroyed any anything like that in our society because Europe was so devastated by the Black Death that it, it totally reordered and restructured um, the society as was. You know, so any kind of caste system was broken. So it's difficult, I think, for a lot of people to appreciate the impact that a caste system has on a society and how it creates a rigidity and um, the the social mores that it is in, imposes. And that is something, without getting too deep, that Phil Kelly has done a fantastic job of showing, not to, not in an over-the-top way, not in a sort of, oh, you know, like over-the-top sort of sociological way. Still within keeping with 40K, grim, dark, but fun, um, you know, harsh but entertaining, you know, that sort of thing. He, he's done a good job of representing the Tao thing and how messed up some of the moments are. So, for instance, um, well, let's, let's, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I've got lost here. I've got lost on a rant and I don't know, even know whether it's pertinent. I guess it is, it is, because the caste system is the thing that I, ne- I never see anyone mention. And I think it is genuine because a lot of people haven't read these books. Like, and this Phil Kelly's novels just aren't as popular as other people's. And I don't know why, because I find him one of the best writers GW have got right now. And it, I don't know what it is. It might just be personal taste, but I find his stuff tremendous. And the whole thing with the, ca- tau, ca- the Tau God of Chaos. The Tau Chaos God, I should say. Um, it seems to have just gone by everybody. I've made videos on it. I've talked about it a lot. No one else seems to talk about it. No one else seems to know about it. It's weird. It's like, again, it's because it's in this novel and no one's really mentioned it. But anyway, Phil Kelly's the guy behind this. And obviously the Tao God thing is the big part of War of Secrets. Um, But there's also, you know, um, a number of other aspects in that novel. Now, I was hooked immediately with this and I like the writing style as well. And, you know, the stuff, half the novels about Space Marine stuff, half the novels sort of like Tao stuff like this. And I enjoyed both of them. Now, I've gone back then and uh, found the first sort of Tao novel he wrote, which was Blades of Damocles, which basically covers the... um, It's basically a retcon of the original idea of the first Damocles Golf Crusade. I mean, kind of. Um, I mean, I would take this version of events over the original version of events, which was part of another novel series. I think it was called Rogue Traders or something like that. I think it was by Andy Chambers. Very good series, but it's, it's dated now compared to this. Obviously, it was kind of released around... The time Tau, the Tau M, the the Tau race was originally released into you know by Games Workshop by into forty k. So this this Blades of Damocles one is kind of a reworking and updating of that, um, making it make more sense within the sort of current because forty k has changed a fair bit since then. Anyway, this is an amazing novel. Um, it was the thing that really got me hooked on Phil Kelly's work. Some of the some of the scenes in this are amazing. Uh, not just for the action, which I think is great. It's really, it's my kind of thing. It's got Kato Sicarius as a sergeant before he becomes a captain and so on, and uh, working with Numitor. And this is these these are characters. What I like about Phil Kelly's stuff is because he's sort of seems to have complete con- creative control over what he's doing. He and he works on the the law development side of things, um, the 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 sort of games development side of things for the race. He's able to slip in little hints about what's coming for the Tau sort of model range, I guess you said, the real world stuff. He slips that in, in this novel. So this novel, released five, six years ago, has him talking about some of the stuff that's only just sort of recently come out uh, for the Tau Empire, these massive battle suits and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, he, he seems to be directing it, which I like. So they're reading these novels, you get a real flavour of sort of where the sort of development team, where Games Workshop want to take the range, the universe, and so on. And the things that are clever with it as well are the things he starts setting up. The the totalitarian and horrible and sort of <clears throat> really, really bizarre and dark and um, horrible nature of Tao society. The restricted... Uh, just harsh, sort of, I mean, totalitarian, I would say, you know, uh, nature of their society based on caste, based on the fact that they are ruled by this ethereal, um, you know, leadership caste who, you know, like have this sort of pheromone 
um, control over the town. And it is so blatant as well within the novels. Like, I, like again, people who, like, say that the town are the good guys, you're completely missing the point here. And these novels really reflect that because the amount of times you see the juxtaposition between what the Tao are doing and then they're disgusted seeing what the Imperium are doing. But then really they're both doing the same thing. It's just the Imperium is far more blunt and brutal and honest about what it's doing in terms of using populations. Its methods are, are more blunt and honest. And Farsight even has moments where he recognises this, but not really. Like he recognises... The fact that the, you know the human race has has gone beyond adaptation because it has found ways of doing things which are blunt but expedient. You know that that they work; these systems work. That's why they keep doing them, even though there are better ways. Even though these kind of you know like uh, you know like little short small things about he talks about like the armored tanks of the Imperium. It's like well, they're not the best vehicles. They're not very good fighting vehicles, but they're mass produced and easy to use and they're easy to maintain and all that sort of stuff. Uh, the Space Marines, the, the Garun Shah, as they call them, um, they're shockingly, to the to the Tau, they're shocking. But they also understand them in a certain way that, for instance, like Tau society, um, they call them the, you know, the, the, the warrior caste of the humans, of the Imperium. The Space Marines are like the, the Fire Warriors are to the Tau. And they are, because the Fire, because they live in a caste system, for generations now, the different castes have been undergoing uh, genetic and um, eugenic uh, sort of breeding and um, enhancement and development. You see how interesting this is? If you're someone who's like, oh, I don't like the Tau because they're aliens, you really need to read these books. They're so interesting. It's so interesting to see the 40K universe from the perspective of, of these guys. And uh, they offer a, a unique view on the universe because they aren't the Imperium. They aren't the Eldar, who are this old race. They aren't the Necrons, because the Necrons are just, you know, all the problems the Necrons have. They aren't the humans, because, you know, they aren't the Imperial. They aren't, they aren't Chaos guys. They aren't the Imperium bogged down with sort of theological problems and, you know, issues of the Chaos gods and all that. Well, I mean, I guess they have technically. But, you know what I mean? They're sort of free in this, of this in a way, and they're able to look at the universe in this from a different perspective and it's just it's interesting to see the hypocrisy of their own their own efforts to expand as an empire their own idea of their divine right to spread the tauva the greater good but at the same time at the same time they're just doing what every other race within the within the universe is doing what the imperium is doing it's just their methods are different and I think that's beautiful. I think that's beautiful. And Phil Kelly's the one that's really given life to this universe and he's really building something and writing something that's so interesting to me anyway. I love it. I love it. I think this is fantastic. And I'm so glad I started reading these stories because I feel like the 40K universe would be less rich without them. And like, for instance, there's a moment which stands out to me as Kato Sakaria stepping on a Tau woman. But this woman is like... She's a bit of a deviant within Tao society. Not really, like in any other society, she wouldn't be. But because of the nature of Tao society, she's a water cast. So what she should be doing, she has very set roles. She shouldn't be doing anything. They call it being between two spheres, which is a problem that Farsight gets. But let me explain it with someone else. So that when I discuss it with Farsight, you can see what I'm saying. It's being between two spheres. And this is interesting how he uses these two characters, these two moments. He uses this moment as a precursor to explain the Farsight one to show what the big issue is when Farsight does what he does, which I'll explain in a moment. So she likes to, she's arty. She likes to be, she likes to make sculptures and stuff. She shouldn't be doing that. That is against the Tova. That is against her caste. That is, show, she is between spheres. She is a deviant. She is a problem. She is disharmo. She's causing disharmony within the Tova. She's not doing what she's meant to be doing. If anyone found her, they would come and get her and remove her. You get me? They, they would disappear her because she's problematic. So it's interesting to me that that sort of stuff is in this novel. Anyway, well, Sicarius comes in, obviously, and he doesn't care about this, and he just steps on this wretched creature, this wretched Xenos. Perfect. Perfect to see that juxtaposition with a between the Imperium and the Tau. And it is like, I mean, it might be overplayed, it might be a bit of a tropey kind of thing at this point, but it is true and it is still powerful to see these two races, which are similar in so many ways, 
but also different in some fundamental ways. And again, the sort of um, the the mistaken. It's funny to see people come in under the mistaken belief that the Tao are the good guys, because what, <laughs> what, why, why would you think that? Why would you think that if you knew anything about their society, which we're going to get into? Because this has become a bit of a rant. I've been ranting for nearly 10 minutes now just about the Tao in general, which isn't what I meant to do. So let's get back to the book. But, you know, just to finish this off, it's interesting to me that so many people put such emphasis on the Tao being the good guys. And I see this so many times, well, the Tao might do this, but, you know, they're probably the best kind of guy. What do you mean by good? This is why 40K is, is, a, is a great law, great sort of universe. When it's at its best, it represents faith, it represents honour, it represents meaning, purpose, what it means to be this or that. And you might say it's a morally grey universe. I don't think it is. I think it's the same as the real universe, where there is grey, right? There is good, there is evil, but there is also grey, you know? And oft times, most things are grey, because they're at such low level anyway, in terms of importance, that they probably are just grey, morally or, you know, whatever. But that's kind of, the, the 40K universe is the real world on steroids. But it is like, so you have massive amounts of good, massive amounts of evil, uh, but there's grey just entwined there, like a piece of marble with veins in it, you know? That's how I view it, you know? The marble is good or bad, and the, but the veins within it are grey. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> that's not a good metaphor. Anyway, what I'm saying is, it's funny to me that so many people think that the Tao, when I see people saying this sort of thing, I know for a fact they haven't read the novels. I know for a fact they haven't read any of these novels. They haven't gone and thought about it. They probably don't know much about like sort of what this is based on, what, what Phil Kelly's drawing on, what the law team are drawing on. Because obviously I've done those those big campaign videos where we cover the Damocles Gulf or Taros and stuff like this. And they're obviously drawing on the same things. Uh, themes from, from history of, you know, these sort of, historical, you know, events that have been similar, you know, with castes, um, religious stuff, you know, leadership castes, uh, that sort of thing, uh, you know, like uh, utterly segmented societies that are based on caste systems, but also the sort of totalitarian nature of societies when you've got these kind of rigid social structures in place. I'm talking too much about stuff that isn't the book. So I'm going to stop now and we're going to go back to the book. So, I discovered Phil Kelly's work and I read this, this first novel. Went into Blades of Damocles. Fantastic novel. Highly recommend it. These are all audio books as well. So if you need to save time, I understand. And you go and pick them up and, and listen to them. You'll get through them quicker. Then he did this. He did a number of short stories. Some of them are fantastic. Well, they're all fantastic, in fact. And they all link up really well. That's the thing. He's created a whole sort of part, corner of the 40K law for himself. And they're all, they all link. Characters come back things are referenced it's fantastic and the farsight character because it's all written by one author which is often my problem with the heresy and some other things when they start bringing in other authors to do whole sections of the law like heresy is the big problem for me because you get characters be in you know when when another author pens a character the pre-existing character traits of it often disappear because that author not it, it might not necessarily be able to portray that character in that way or might simply not understand the character in the same way as the original author. Now, you might understand a character completely different to the author's understanding of a character, but because the author writes it in a consistent way and writes it in this way that he understands it, if you understand it differently, it doesn't matter because you, you're looking at the author's work in the same way all the time. So when another author comes along and writes the character in a different way, it kind of breaks the it breaks your engagement with the character. Did that make sense? It felt like it made sense <laughs> when I said it. So uh, there's another novel by I'm going to go and pick up um, called Farsight. It's like a sort of Heroes of the Imperium type novel, and I'm going to go and pick that up because maybe that's got some gems in there. But there's a number of other novels that are covering sort of Farsight's early life, and then we get to this Crisis of Faith. Now, what I would say is you've got to read Blades of Damocles to understand the journey that Farsight's on, right? And you should definitely read the short stories as well because it all adds to this fairly seamless whole of a, of a big, grand story arc. And um, like I say, it's been a, this Crisis of Faith novel has been out for a long time. I've just never got around to it until I saw the audio book come up and I was like, I'm going to get that, boom, get that done, boom, listen to that when I've got free time. 
and or when I'm doing stuff. And you know, it was a fantastic experience. And like in terms of the audio book quality as well, pretty good, pretty good. But um, the the story itself was uh, magical. But you need that Blades of Damocles to get the references. So what happens? One of the big things in Blades of Damocles that happens. There's a couple of big things, um, and they reflect on the. Farsight's gradual falling out of love, his his crisis of faith in the Tauvar, and his gradual realization of what the Ethereals are doing, what is happening to Tau society. Now, what he's going to do with this, I haven't got a clue. That's the magical thing about it, because I can see the problems as he sees them, and you see these challenging situations he's he's presented with. But what's he going to do with these things? I don't know. I know that he creates the Farsight Enclaves, but at this point, I don't know what's going to happen to bring him to that point. There's hints. There's hints. We get a lot of hints. Um, there's a couple of visions and stuff like this because, spoilers, obviously, there's a there's a Zenchi demon that comes in and it's just so clever. Oh, God. Okay. So, I mean, what happens in Damocles Golf that carries over to this one that you need to remember, you need to know? Uh, Pure Tide, the sort of first, you know, best commander, f most famous Tau commander uh, until Shadow Sun and Farsight, the sort of primogenitor of the, f you know, the, the, I don't know, primogenitor is a bit much. He's like the most, at that time, the most famous Tau commander. And he trains these protégés, uh, you know, up and coming officers who have got merits. So Farsight, Shadow Sun and um, Keese, Keese, I think it's Keese. I don't know. And that's how these guys all know each other. They trained together. They were they were bonded together. And there's got all sorts of stuff about, um, you know, you get visions of Tao society. And I don't want to get too distracted. I've already been ranting too much, right? If you want to know interesting little details about Tao society, which show, which are just interesting on their own and add flavor and add understanding of why the Tao act like they do and um, stuff like that. But also, but also more importantly, um, Show how dark the society is. All these novels have them, and Phil Kelly's done a fantastic job of showing them. It is he's subtle, it's nuanced, it's all these things, all these fancy words to describe cool, basically. Cool and interesting. Cool and interesting. And that's what these novels are. So Pure Tide, he's old. And the the Ethereals, they don't want to lose him. So they decide to um rip his mind out of him and create it as a copy and then insert that mind and graft it to all the Tau officers. And this is a, a big calamity because basically, um, I've explained this in my review of the Blades of Damocles. I think, I don't know whether I explained it well. It was a few years ago when I did that video. But uh, they graft Pure Tide's mind onto all these younger officers. And uh, it goes a bit wrong because at first it works fine, but they're kind of locked because all they've got is this, they've got, their own minds have been subsumed under this clone mind of pure tide. And this is on a planet, right? This is the entire sort of, this is thousands of Tau officers, right? They've, they've got this on them and it works at first, but the problem is it's because it's not really pure tide. It's this, this, um, engramic or something like they call it engram. I don't know, whatever fancy science word made up science word, but it's like, because it's like a clone of his mind. It's not actually him. It can't, evolve its thinking all it can do it's trap itself in where he his mind was at the time it was stripped from him now farsight is the one who did this and it kills the guy obviously or turns him into a vegetable um and he just, like he's, he's he's just gone you know uh his mind's sort of been taken from him and stuff like that and and, and it goes along to all these officers and it causes a big problem and they all start having breakdowns basically because they they can't function properly because their mind like i say at first it was effective it worked it allowed them to use his tactical knowledge to overpower the enemy but as soon as the imperium started adapting to these tactics that were coming at them uh the space marines especially these people's minds broke because they weren't able to they weren't able to think outside the box they weren't able to think about the new situation all they could do is stick to what the clone mind was saying. But the clone mind wasn't able to change itself. It was locked into being what it is, if you get me. It was a program that couldn't alter. Um, so, yeah, it was interesting. It's an interesting... I mean, it's cool. It's interesting. And, again, it's one of the things that starts to break 
Farsight's mind because he sees how the Ethereals react to this and what happens to all these young Fire Warriors. Wasted, you know? They're all just wasted. Their minds are gone. They all become sort of incapacitated forever. You know what I mean? There's, there's no saving them. Um, and he sees this and he, and he breaks his heart, you know? But he has one of the main moments where he's fighting like a Space Marine commander. And he falls in a lake. <clears throat> anyway, he uses knowledge he's picked up from working with the Earthcast and stuff like this to repair his machine and save himself from dying. But this is a no-no because he's used knowledge that he shouldn't have. He is between spheres. So you see this again, This the the problem of uh, uh, the, the nature of Tao's society being so rigid that even someone like Farsight is possibly threatened with uh, exile or execution because... He basically saves his own life because he's used knowledge that he shouldn't even have. He should have been a fire warrior and he should have just died. But he saved himself using knowledge which is forbidden to his caste. Now, if you're the Ethereals, you, the reason why you separate all these is to control the society. You cause the society to be broken up so you can control it more easily. This is something, I mean, like, this is like politics 101. All right, this is like political theory 101. You know, go and read Aristotle. How does a tyrant, how can an oligarchy, how can this, how can an aristocracy dominate a city? Well, you cause it by one way or another to be broken up into different uh, groups. And then you can play each group, you know, the British Empire. You know what I mean? This is what, this all empires, in fact, the Byzantine Empire were like experts at this. Um, the Romans to a lesser extent, depending, sometimes they were, sometimes they wasn't, you know, whatever. Going off on a tangent, but you know, like these these are concepts that are quite common, and um, you see it writ large, and you see him beginning to understand this, and it's it's a great personal journey that you you're with Farsight on this as he as he encounters problem after problem. Like there's a whole thing on um, Arcanusia where he's been fighting this war for half of his adult life. This is before he became. This is the war that made him famous, but they're about to win, and the the Ethereals pull them out. And it's kind of like, are they pulling them out because they don't want, it's um, it's like a, what's a, what's a modern analogy, I guess? Like It's like a Douglas MacArthur sort of situation where you don't want the person, or a Julius Caesar, let's go Julius Caesar, that's something most people will understand easier. You know, um, you don't want to let, what the, what the Senate should have done is not let Caesar conquer Gaul. You get me? They should have pulled him out way before then. Uh, even though he was on the verge of conquering the place, it doesn't matter. They should have pulled him out way before then, because it wouldn't, because the Ethereals possibly feared that, uh, in the same way, because the, fear, the Ethereals possibly feared that Farsight would become, you know, a hero to an extent that they wouldn't be able to control or influence to a to a degree. He would have some kind of latitude which they didn't want. Um, so they, you know, any time any commander ri rises up to that level and they can't fully control them, they kind of have to cut them down before it can happen, I guess, you know, unless it's someone completely under their control. You see a sort of similar thing with Shadow Sun and how they play off these top commanders of the Tao Empire against each other. It's all down to the Ethereals and what they're doing. And the Ethereal stuff is just, it's so amazing. I mean, in this... Okay, before we move on, before we move on, the other thing you need to remember. Oh no, I've covered it. Yeah, so those two things, like so, Farsight he uses this knowledge that he doesn't have to save his own life, like in a personal sense, and he's reprimanded on this and almost stripped of his rank and stuff like this for something that you would think is like good. He's using his initiative and stuff. No, no, no. It's it's like heresy. It's like the Imperium's version of this would be heresy, you know? It's an Inquisitor using alien weaponry, the Inquisitor using psychic powers, the Inquisitor using a chaos, um, you know, like a, a captured chaos weapon, like a demon-infused sword, you know, like Eisenhorn, you know what I mean? It's, it's like Eisenhorn using chaos powers to defeat chaos. It's that same idea of heresy, and, I mean, that's clever as hell. I love that, I love that. Uh, and, that, and the way it's portrayed, it does show this fantastically. Um, and then you, you're going to think, like, well, is the Tao Empire analogous to the Imperium in other ways? Well, it probably is. Oh, I, I don't want to get too distracted. I want to carry on in the book. I hope you're enjoying this. This is just me ranting in general. But you the Tao Empire and the Imperium are very analogous to each other. Um, they have warrior castes. They have worker castes. I mean, the Imperium is so big and vast that it's kind of it's kind of decentralized. But because that, that, that's only because it's so big and it's the only way to maintain any kind of order is by having sort of controlled disorder, you know, like planets can have different forms of governments and so on, but they still have global sort of 
imperial-wide organisations such as the Administratum, the Arbites, the Inquisition, the Ecclesiarchy, obviously the Ecclesiarchy and the Arbites being the big ones, the Munitorum, responsible for military affairs, that sort of thing. And they span all planets. Um, the Tau are a lot more rigid in their control. And, you know, yeah, it's it's interesting, really. So if you, if you go by that way, well, is, are the Ethereals the Emperor, basically the sort of embodiment of the Emperor. And this is something I've thought about for a long time. Is that what they're aiming for? The old lore on the Emperor being a shamanistic cast of early psychic users who, this is what the story of the old Emperor used to be. He was, there was all shamans and stuff on Earth and they used to reincarnate themselves in a very Buddhist kind of, you know, um, sort of, I don't know. There, there, there's a lot of stuff with old, like, Eastern sort of religions and stuff, mysticism and everything. And uh, that's kind of the idea that you you reincarnate. Uh, you go, you die, and you reincarnate into a new body, and you continue on and on and on and on. Um, but in, in the 40K universe, these people were finding it harder and harder and harder to reincarnate because of the powers of the warp. And so eventually they committed mass ritual suicide so that they would all reincarnate as a single avatar of all of their collective consciousness and souls and spirits in the form of the emperor. Now, my idea was, is that what the Tau are? But the Ethereals haven't done that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the Ethereals haven't done that. And they're not that psychic either, but it's the similar kind of idea. I don't know. I don't know. Because now you've got this Tau God thing, which also is a fantastic concept. But I've talked too much. I'm just ranting. So... That's the the end of the Blades of Damocles is where we, and then we rejoin them at the, um, in this Crisis of Faith novel, in the aftermath of that war, of the Imperium being pushed back. They think, they act more like it's like their victory. They managed to defeat this Imperium. Uh, and that's definitely how they present it to the rest of Tao society as a, in a propaganda sense. But uh, they all know that they were lucky. Um, they don't realise how lucky they were because the, the Imperium never explains to them. Yeah, we're, we're withdrawing our forces because like the Tyranids are about to eat McCrag. So we've got to get back home. They don't tell them like that. <laughs> so the Tau are now preparing a big invasion uh, to cross the Damocles Gulf and retake a bunch of territory they lost to the Imperium in the in this Damocles, first Damocles Gulf Crusade. And um, Farsight is given the, the, the rank uh, of commander on this, uh, the leadership of it. And it's really just sort of from here, we, we have multiple instances of him sort of having a crisis of faith, losing his faith in the whole thing. Um, moments where he snaps and breaks in a way that he's not supposed to. Uh, and as it goes on, we, we get to this point at the end where you have this giant climactic battle and he's already starting to break away. He's got a little clique of his own sort of officers in a very interesting way um, who are also sort of breaking away and are loyal to him above the Ethereals, which is something that doesn't normally happen. And they're so far away from Tau Space as well, like a couple of years away from Tau Space uh, because of the sort of technological handicap that Tau have in terms of space travel, that they're kind of separated and alone. So it's going to be interesting to see how he finally, the next novel, which I'm going to pick up, it isn't an audio book, so I'm going to have to get the book and read it. But um, I really want to read it. I want to know what happens next. I want to know what led him to break completely and create a, a parallel society in this cluster of Tau worlds uh, or reconquered Tau worlds, the, the, the far side enclaves. It's going to be fascinating. But the, the novel is interesting because there's... Um, there's a chaos demon that comes in. And now this happens is the Tau, in the aftermath of the uh, the events uh, of the Battle of Dalith, uh, the Tau capture a warp engine. Now, unfortunately for them, they don't understand the warp. So they bring in this water cast dude who can translate like Imperial text and he touches the warp engine and he gets possessed, which is, a, it's a little bit, oh, he got possessed today. But it's it's a nice, it's fine. You know, it's a little bit gimmicky. But he, he, uh, he becomes possessed by a Zench dude and it's this, this Zench demon's exploration of Tao society, which is so funny. Plus, he's just murdering people for fun. And it's, you know, it adds like um, this sterile sort of nice, like, I don't know, it's all like Cloud City, you know what I mean? Like in Star Wars. It's, ta it's Cloud City with blue men who are like, you know, very rigid and, you know, have a sort of very, I don't know, that, that the society, the Tao society as it is, but uh, then you've got this guy walking around uh, pretending to be a Tau, but he's just like utterly possessed this Tau 
a diplomat. And he's just going around murdering people. <laughs> like at one point he gets like a blanket and wraps it around a drone and then smashes the drone until it's broken. He starts using this as a mace and he just goes around killing people um, over town. And he's just, oh, it's so funny. It's so funny, like in a dark way, obviously. Obviously it's, it's terrible, but it's also hilarious. And this is the kind of thing that Phil Kelly's capable of. Really clever stuff, but also fun, brutal stuff. And he's also really good at the battle scenes. I love his battle scenes. They're so, there's so much energy. And he knows how to reach a crescendo in the violence. And he paints a picture so well. It's beautiful. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of where the, the, the story goes. And have I ranted too much? I think I've ranted too much and I've completely missed the point here. I wasn't meaning to uh, speak for 35 minutes. Jesus Christ. Okay. We're going to wrap this up here. <laughs> if you want a fun experience, I recommend this. But if you want to get the full enjoyment out of it, you've got to go and get Blades of Damocles. I told people to read this a long time ago, but um, I'm finally catching up on this far side stuff. All the short stories are fantastic and they really enrich this part of the lore. And if you want to understand the Tau, if you want to understand the Imperium, in fact, because there's a lot of really insight into uh, an outsider's view of the Imperium of Man, which is fascinating to see, to be honest, which, again, is something that the Tau... Give, the, give authors an opportunity to do that other races can't. Um, the, this, this novel is fantastic. And Farsight is a fantastic character. I remember in Blades of Damocles, one of the, the best quotes he ever gave was, you know, he's getting pissed off and he's, he's talking about the waste of all these firecast warriors due to the, the, the sort of insane plans of the ethereals. And he says, you know, they spend our lives like like rounds from a rifle, you know what I mean? Like, like bullets from a gun. They spend our lives like this. And I like, I think that's drawing on sort of classical quotes. I can't remember who said it. Someone said something very similar, but I like that, that it's that kind of, that's his attitude to this, that gradually he's, he's starting to sort of turn on his society or lose, he's losing faith. And that's why the novel's a good, it's got a good title, Crisis of Faith. Because he is starting to, I don't know, become aware of everything that's occurring and the system that's been put in place and the sort of horror of it, I guess, because it is terrible. And again, Tao fanboys, I don't know what you're thinking. It's much like, I love the Tao, uh, but not in the way that I think they're the, oh, they're the good guys. There is no good guys in 40K. That's not the point of the universe, right? The universe is to be harsh and dark and interesting and play with ideas. And this is the perfect example of that um but then again i guess i don't know that sort of that sort of thing isn't for everybody is it i guess whatever do what you want i don't care i get the enjoyment out of i get this enjoyment out of this and i think it's fantastic and uh, i cannot recommend it enough so go and pick it up um oh yeah cheeky shell if you want to pick it up the audio book up please consider picking it up through audible using my links below if you've never used audible you can get a free subscription and that helps me out I'll get a little bit, a little, bit, a little bit back. Or pick up the books and also I'll get a little bit back if you use the links below. But anyway, I'll be back again soon. I'll try and do more of these reviews. Let me know in the comments what you think. Was it too ranty? It probably was. I haven't done one of these for a while, so I'm just going to study a waxing lyrical on a, a novel that I enjoyed that I just read. That's basically all I've done for half an hour or nearly 40 minutes now. God, I've got to stop. I haven't done one of these for a while. The next one will be a bit more centered. But I really enjoyed this and it, you know, the Tao stuff is really entertaining. Um, Phil Kelly's a great writer and uh, he, he deserves more props for the work he's doing on this. But anyway, definitely recommend it. Definitely pick it up. I'll be getting the next one and I'll read that as quick as I can and uh, hopefully get a review out to you guys and my thoughts on it. And it'll be a bit more centred, I guess. Anyway, I'll see you later. Bye-bye. Thanks very much for watching. Cheers. Give likes and subscribe and all that. Bye-bye.